The parent company of CBS is changing hands. The Dallas Stars are launching a free streaming service. Dan Hurley and UConn made it official, and we are taking a look at the state of USA Gymnastics as Simone Biles seeks to add to her singular career at the upcoming Olympics. It's Tuesday, July 9th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. Paramount and Skydance are merging after all. A deal was agreed to a few weeks ago, shut down at the last minute by Paramount owner Sherry Redstone, and now seems to actually be happening. Assuming no other curveballs get thrown at the last minute here, Skydance, along with a consortium that includes private equity firms Redbird Capital Partners and KKR, will spend more than $8 billion between investments into Paramount and the acquisition of its parent's company, National Amusements, at a $2.4 billion valuation. Skydance will give Paramount a capital injection of $1.5 billion, and David Ellison, son of Oracle founder Larry Ellison, will take over as the combined company's CEO. That will put a new boss atop one of the major broadcasters of the NFL, PGA Tour, college basketball, and Big Ten football, among others. Each of those media deals are locked in for at least five more years, so the new regime will have time to decide on its approach to sports. Before all that happens, there will be a 45-day period in which Paramount can entertain other offers, plus a standard dose of regulatory scrutiny. When it's all done, a media giant will be in new hands. Quick disclosure note, Redbird IMI is an investor in front office sports. The Dallas Stars became the latest team to go their own way on local sports rights. The team is launching its own streaming service called Victory Plus and offering it for free to fans in what's considered their local market, which is Texas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, and Arkansas. The move severs ties between the Stars and Valley Sports, which is still working to prove in bankruptcy court that it is a viable business. The Stars could take a short-term revenue hit by dropping its regional sports network, but this allows it to get started on its next media business model while eliminating any uncertainty about their local broadcast situation with the start of the season fewer than three months away. The name Victory Plus is notable in that it does not imply that this service is only about the Stars. The Mavericks, Rangers, and Wings are still on the Valley Sports channel, but now have another option when their contracts end or if Bally's fails to emerge from bankruptcy. The Enhanced Games are looking to raise $300 million. What are the Enhanced Games, you ask? This is the questionable project of Peter Thiel to create an Olympics-like contest in which performance-enhancing drugs are not just allowed, but encouraged. The Enhanced Games are quick to point out that all athletes receive mandatory free health screenings, including genomic sequencing before events. The company plans to work with athletes to figure out the right mix of PEDs for them. The Enhanced Games will include swimming, track and field, gymnastics, and weightlifting events, and, in a true test of their safety protocols, combat sports. Athletes will be paid and can win million-dollar prizes for breaking world records. The first competitions are planned for next year. And Dan Hurley has assigned a six-year, $50 million contract with UConn. The coach turned down an offer that would have guaranteed him $20 million more from the Los Angeles Lakers. Instead, he will stay at the school where he has won back-to-back NCAA championships on a deal that pays him $400,000 as a base salary, then adds on $6.4 million next season and more in future years for speaking, consulting, and media obligations. He also gets a retention bonus of $1 million annually. Hurley's $8.3 million average salary makes him the third highest paid college basketball coach behind Bill Self and John Calipari. I'm joined now by Ari Saperstein, host of the Olympics podcast, Blind Landing. Welcome, Ari. Hey, Owen. Glad to be back here. Great to have you back on. You were just at the U.S. Olympics gymnastics trials. What was the big story coming out of those? It's Simone. It's always Simone for as long as she's competing. Uh, She won trials by six points, which is just such a huge margin over the rest of the field. There is nothing new to say about how amazing she is um, other than in real life there up close. The height she gets on floor compared to everyone else is just it is unreal. Um, And going with her to the Olympics, the rest of the team was named. There are three returning gymnasts from the 2020 Tokyo Games. You got Suni Lee, the reigning all around champ. Jordan Childs, Jade Carey, they're all going back to Paris. And along with them is Hesley Rivera. She's a newly eligible 16-year-old who won the Junior National Championships last year. Um, And, you know, Simone in the press conference after the competition, she really described this as a redemption tour. In fact, actually, all the returning Olympians use the word redemption at one point or another. Hmm. Um, You know, I think we each have to remember is the U.S. had a decade-long gold medal streak in international competition until Tokyo when they won silver after Simone pulled out. So a lot of these Olympians that are coming back, 
they're just motivated by getting that gold, uh, know, doing what they know that they can do, having this like full Olympic experience, one with fans in the crowd and their families present because that didn't happen for them last time because of COVID. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's always interesting. You know, silver being something you need to redeem is, you know, it says something about their history. And I feel like with dynasties, that's kind of what happens is like other people, other countries get hungrier and catch up and it's hard to maintain everything you're doing that made you, you know, got you that gold streak. Um, you know, if this is like the returning team from Tokyo, essentially, it sounds like that sounds like stability. Are there any surprises in terms of what actually happened at the trials? Yeah, as as stable as uh, that team sounds, the route to putting that team together was completely unexpected. Over the course of just like four or five days, we saw a number of the top prospects have season season ending injuries at Olympic trials. The first was a few days before competition. There was this training day for gymnasts close to the public. The only people there were the gymnasts and a couple dozen journalists, myself included. At the end of the day, Sky Blakely, who finished second at the U.S. trials last month, she ruptured her Achilles. That was the first injury. 48 hours later, on the first day of competition, just minutes back to back, there were two other gymnasts also with leg injuries. Kayla DiCello, who is right on the bubble to make the team. And Shylee Jones, who's really considered one of the two or three best gymnasts alive, just behind Biles. And um, those three injuries really opened up the door for some of those returning Olympians to showcase their experience. Like a, a lot of thought, a lot of the thought uh, going into trials was like, this was going to be such a tough decision for this Olympic selection committee. But as the week went on, it just became so clear that the group from Tokyo plus Rivera was just undeniably the best option. Um, and to put it all in context, it's amazing because Hesley Rivera, the 16-year-old going with all these experienced teammates, she didn't have a real shot just days earlier. I mean, her coach seemed pretty surprised himself. He said, they were thinking, okay, Olympic trials this year, this is just a stepping stone for the 2028 games. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that just really speaks to the ripple effect that happened from injuries yeah. and how quickly things can change in the sport. Yeah, so three injuries in a short amount of time. Anything systemic or structural there that people are looking at, or is it just too hard to tell? Well, you know, that's what everyone really wanted to talk about over the weekend. Um, I heard a lot of theories. I I spent a chunk of the final night of competition in um, a box suite that was for a bunch of former Olympians, and there was a consensus there in that space that um, – the impact that the increasing difficulty might be having on gymnast bodies could be to blame. Uh, but another person I ran into, Dr. Bill Sands, who's like one of the leading sports science experts on gymnastics, he said, look, you know, there's no way of knowing until there's a review of all the injuries and until there's an understanding of all the circumstances surrounding them. And uh, and we asked Lee Lee Lung, the CEO of USA Gymnastics, about this in the mix zone after the competition. She said they're planning to do a review of the injuries and look at their training model after the Paris Olympics to just see if there is anything they could be doing to mitigate what happened. And the increasing difficulty you referred to, is that just because the competition is getting harder and better and Simone keeps, you know, raising the bar or perhaps literally um, or yeah, what, what does that refer to exactly? Yeah, yeah. Well, we all know the perfect 10. Um, that was a scoring system that went away about 20 years ago in favor of open-ended scoring. What's open-ended scoring? Open-ended scoring is this system that basically means you'll get rewarded for doing more difficult skills if you're inventing new difficult feats the way that Simone does, whereas it used to all just be capped at a certain point. And so now, if you can do high difficulty really well, you get really rewarded for that in the sport. And so it incentivizes people to be doing a higher level of difficulty than they had historically been doing. And so, you know, it's um, it's possible that there are, are some people's bodies who are just more muscular, more suited to this new difficult world we're living in, or at least that is the theory that some of the former Olympians I was um, with were tossing out. And the other thing that comes to mind for me there is just the schedule. And it makes sense to have the trials not too much before the Olympics, but because it's just a few weeks before the actual Olympics, 
that um that lowers the severity of injury that can take you out of the Olympics. Is there any talk of that or, or is this just how things are done? Um, well, you know, it's a really interesting situation because a lot of the female gymnasts who are competing here at that kind of closed training day I was talking about, it was the first time that a lot of them were testing out their newest, hardest upgrades for the first time. Things that they are ultimately wanting to compete in Paris, but it was expected that the U.S. Olympic trials to make the gymnastics team were going to be almost as hard or as challenging as trying to win a medal at Paris. Yeah. And so we were starting to see some of those bigger upgrades here. Um, and, you know, it's such an individual thing, gymnast to gymnast, because it's the science and art of trying to peak. When do you go for it? How much experience do you need competing some of those skills beforehand? And to what you're getting at a little bit, how long can you sustain consecutively doing those skills for? Can you do them for a couple weeks and be okay? Can you do them for a couple months and be okay? Can you do them for longer as Simone seems to be able to just whip out her triple double, you know, at any mm -hmm. moment? Um, so it it ultimately varies gymnast to gymnast. Um, and it's this hard thing that they, you know, there's no one perfect answer for. Yeah. And getting back to Simone, um, I know her relationship with USA Gymnastics hasn't always been perfect, um, not a perfect 10 um, over the years. <laughs> Is any, look, any update you can provide on where she's at with that? Yeah, I mean, it's been a really tumultuous relationship that she's had with USA Gymnastics. Obviously, she's a, a, a survivor of um, abuse from Larry Nasser and has you know, been very uh, public and vocal of her advocacy around that. So Simone, by and large, in the past year has said that USA Gymnastics is moving in the right direction. A big part of that is the day-to-day -day operations for the women's gymnastics team are run by two former gymnasts, two former gymnasts who trained in that uh, Bella Caroli, Marta Caroli, Larry Nasser era, um, who are really intentional, from what I can tell, from talking to them about doing whatever they can to make a real cultural shift. So I think that's part of it. But also, last year, Simone, reflecting on Tokyo, said that, you know, when she got the twisties of the last Olympics around that time, there were officials from USA Gymnastics who were putting internal pressure on her. They were calling her, um, you know, their gold medal token. Also a very, you know, loaded word as a woman of color, I'm yes. sure, to hear. Um, and Lily, the CEO of USA Gymnastics, a year ago, she responded to this. She said this was the first she was hearing about it. They were taking it seriously. So when I was talking with Lily, the, the CEO, this past Sunday, I said, you know, what has USA Gymnastics done to ensure that Simone doesn't feel this way? And Lily pointed to the fact that there is this new leadership, this new leadership of former gymnasts um, who are in charge, and that's different than the leadership that was putting pressure on Simone Biles. I asked Lily for specifics about what's being done to check in and communicate with Simone. She didn't give many details, um, so we don't really know how things have changed for Simone per se, but generally things seem to move in the right direction. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes these things don't, don't just, you know, switch, you know, in, in a month or a year, it's, it's, you know, cultures take a long time to change. Um, he also spoke with the CEO of one of USA Gymnastics biggest sponsors, GK Elite Sportswear. They provide a lot of apparel for the, the gymnastics team. Uh, what did you get out of that? Well, you know, <laughs> I have to say that when I went to meet up with Matt Cohen, the CEO of uh, GK Elite, he was the only person I saw all week who wasn't a gymnast and wasn't a journalist who was able to get into the press conference room. I mean, to go past three security checkpoints that he would need an escort for. It, I'm just sharing this because it was striking to me because it said a lot about how this company is very important to USA Gymnastics uh -huh. and vice versa. And rightly so, because it's a huge partnership for both sides. So. You know, this, yeah, the CEO of GK Elite, he um, was just saying, obviously, the Olympics are huge for them. It's this marketing play that comes uh, once every four years. They're the leader in the gymnastics apparel space. And, you know, he walked me through some of the numbers from the last games. Uh, 
you know, a 15 to 20% growth in the apparel stock to just keep up with demand, 160% increase in transactions around the Olympics. But Cohen, the CEO, he shared with me something that's very different for this Olympics that could help them to eclipse those past numbers, which is that the company was able to work out a deal with USA Gymnastics and Team USA to start selling copies of the official uh, Olympic leotard for the gymnasts a couple weeks in advance of the games. This is a pretty big deal for them because you can kind of like envision the marketing dream they're hoping for, which is the way that everyone else is wearing, let's say for their favorite football team, you know, a jersey or their favorite bas baseball team or basketball team, uh, the jersey of the team they're watching. Like now for the first time, right, they're hoping like they'll have parents posting pictures of their kids on social in the same leotard that Simone and the rest of the team on TV are. So, I mean, like, you get that this is a very different kind of momentum that they're hoping to generate and was not easy for them to work out um, historically just because under that old leadership at USA Gymnastics, the way that business was run was with a pretty tight grip where they really wanted to just see all profits go to themselves. And um, it was clear that this was something they wanted to have happen for a while. And this was just the first time the stakeholders were game to do it. And I guess the other thing that we talked about was just how this is the company that has individual partnerships with basically every gymnast on the national team, every gymnast that's going to be at the Olympics. Um, and that the other change they've experienced from a business side is just the ripple effect of NIL. Cause hmm. a lot of these gymnasts who also do at NCAA, they're just, they're more expensive for them to work with. Um, yeah. I mean, Simone is an collegiate gymnast though. Also, I'm sure very expensive to work with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And right. And you know, like Livy Dunn, uh, I think is the, the big name on of that course. side as like, you know, the, um, you know, one of the, top 10 the NIL top. earners out there. Yeah, yeah, the absolutely. Oh, well. the, I was going to say the top uh, the top female uh, athlete consistently, yeah. time and time again, and, and top three, usually, when you're mm. uh, including the men into it, too. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, I, I feel like that sort of speaks to uh, what I understand as sort of an evolving tension situation in the gymnastics world, which is like, are you working individually with the gymnasts, or are you working with USA Gymnastics? Um, like, how controlled are they by the, the governing body? Well, that's really something that seems to have changed a lot where, you know, USA Gymnastics, again, with new leadership, um, with these gymnasts at the helm, seem to be pretty accommodating and understanding now, just in the past few years, a big shift from where it was historically about what these gymnast needs are. So one of the things, right, is a number of these athletes that we're seeing on this Olympic team, Jordan Childs, Jade Carey, Suni Lee, the majority of the team actually, have also competed NCAA in the time since the last Olympics. Um, Jade Carey was doing both this year. That takes a lot of agreement from both of those institutions, from mm. the college side, from USA Gymnastics to figure out a lot of tricky scheduling and a lot of tricky commitments and make sure it works for the athletes. That was not something that we saw USA Gymnastics doing in the old regime. Um, and we didn't see NCAA athletes going back and forth between the two. So, you know, I think we're in a moment where gymnasts hold more power than they ever have before. And I mean, honestly, if you're reading between the lines, USA Gymnastics has a lot to prove about how much they've changed. And, um, and, the gymnasts hold a lot of power in that situation. And sort of along those lines, I know we've been very Simone focused, but the Olympics, it's the, the whole thing is going to be kind of Simone focused, I think. Um, yeah, of course. <laughs> you know, she's, she's, she's old for a gymnast. Do you get the sense this is her last Olympics and, and sort of what it feels like she's got such a big brand. Like she's one of the few gymnasts who can really, take her career any direction she wants? Well, you know, we had a press conference with Simone right after trials finished, and she said two pretty notable things about the direction of her career. Of her career. Um, one was that Juliet McCurr from the New York Times asked a very interesting question, which was this kind of <laughs> butterfly effect thing. She asked Simone, if everything had gone her way in Tokyo, would she still be here today? 
vying for Paris, or would she have called it quits? And maybe a little surprisingly, Simone said, no, that she thought maybe regardless, likely regardless, she would have stuck around even if Tokyo ended. So that's that's interesting to think about. And of mm-hmm. course, someone asked Biles the question, what's next for her? Um, to which she said, understandably, she's just thinking about Paris right now. Then sure. there's a nationwide tour that she's actually the organizer of, she and her team, that uh, Simone and the other Olympians are going on. Like, fair enough, that's a lot. Um, but all to say, you know, she said that she was willing to you know be here interested in being here no matter what happened she didn't say anything about la 2028 so you know for now she's left the door open um and i will just say that to have an olympics in your home country is a very special thing that hasn't happened for 32 years the last time it happened was the single biggest gymnastics team ever. We all know Carrie Strug landing the vault on one foot, the Magnificent Seven in Atlanta. So I would not be surprised if Simone and some of the other athletes that were competing at trials that are on this team found it enticing to try and uh, have their own version of that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Ari Saperstein, very interesting stuff. Thanks so much for joining us on the show. Thank you, Owen. That is it for today. Subscribe to Front Office Sports Today if you haven't already and share this episode with someone you think would enjoy it. Thanks for listening. We will see you tomorrow. Tomorrow.